Well, first of all, uh, thank you for joining this session, everyone. Uh, I know it's uh, right after lunch and before Ma Fatang's speech. So this is a very important uh, session, I suppose. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, IT, talk about business, talk about entrepreneurship. So before that, maybe I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Herman Lam. I'm the CEO of Cyberport. Uh, you should know because Cyberport is just next to uh, Hong Kong U, and we have uh, a lot of activities actually together uh, with the university. And, uh, and uh, we are probably the biggest incubator in town for IT and tech startups. Right now on the platform, we have uh, 600 companies. About 500 of those are uh, startups and, uh, and uh, early companies. And uh, majority of them has uh, actually, uh, actually uh, just started the journey in the last couple of years. So the momentum is very strong. And uh, I know today uh, is also a very successful event. In this particular session, we, I have with me four entrepreneurs. So, uh, well, three and a half, I guess. Uh, they, are, they have a lot of experiences in uh, starting their business, using technology to help them to grow uh, their business uh, quite substantially. So I guess the format I'm going to do today is um, I, I, will, I will invite each uh, speaker to come and speak for 10 minutes to explain the project, the business. And then after that, we'll open to the floor for about 15 minutes of a Q&A. So, uh, First of all, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my first speaker, who is, uh, when I say three and a half, I consider him half. So this is Theodore. Theodore is, um, uh, he's going to tell you his project. I get to know him, uh, actually not because of the project he's, he's going to tell you today. I get to know him because he's also very active in the uh, startup space. He has, uh, if not the earliest, one of the earliest uh, co-working space in Hong Kong, so that's I get to know him. But what he's going to tell you today is his uh, uh, luxury online retail business. So without further ado, uh, Theodore. Does this work? Oh, yes, it works. So uh, once again, thank you very much, Herman, for the introduction. And um, it's a pleasure for me to be here at this wonderful conference today. And I guess I shall start uh, by sharing a little bit of my background. So um, in the startup and the technology world, more people know me as one of the co-founders of Cocoon, a community for entrepreneurs. Uh, in the business world, however, more people know, through, uh, know me through my online retailing work, my family jewelry business of mblife.com and Marbell. Today, I will share more on my retail work. When I introduce myself, as an online retailer selling diamonds and diamond jewelry online, most, most people I encounter wonder how I overcome the difficulties in high pricings and the lack of tactile aspects of, purchasing, uh, of the purchasing experience. In my opinion, I do not find selling jewelry with physical products or at a physical store any easier because at the end of the day, jewelry is not something we need like housing clothing, food, or tr transportation. However, just because one does not need something does not mean he or she does not want it. Addressing the areas of trust and understanding what delivers value to our customer is the key to our business, which is what I would like to share with you today. Searching for and focusing on what matters in building trust and delivering value to our customers. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term, a diamond in the rough. In my line of work, at first glance, there are many ordinary things in the retail world. But what matters is finding what creates value to a customer and work on them rigorous, rigorously. Let me start with sharing a few things my team and I developed with uh, online technology and explain how they relate to trust and value to customers. We currently operate on 32 online platforms, servicing customers in 76 countries and 400 cities around the world. And at the same time, offer free shipping and three-day home delivery to any US and UK cities, uh, hopefully more in the near future. It is very important 
that we go to where our customers feel comfortable purchasing online. Places like Amazon.com is where our customers enjoy exploring the world of shopping with just keywords. Free shipping, great customer service, is not just a standard, but a global standard. In my experience, no serious shopper browses on search engines and would be happy to buy a piece of jewelry and wait for over two weeks in shipping. We hold ourselves not only to Hong Kong standards, but global online standards. As for inventory, we pride ourselves of not just having 14,000 styles, but also 100,000 files and images, videos, and 3D models. My colleagues and I are well aware that our customers are well-informed consumers, has need high-quality media as references to help them in deciding who to trust. Images, videos, 3D models are not just for just our inventory, but our digital assets. They help our customers discover what they need when they search using broad terms like anniversary gifts or specific key phrases like 18th birthday presents for girls. We also built an API around our online assets and have over close to uh, half a million fans on our social media. This may sound a little technical, but then it's really what allows us to develop globally. Our API allows us to connect and deliver our digital content around the world. We understand our distribution partners have just, have just as much data needs, and it's best for us and for them to retrieve data at an on-demand basis. This line of thought is manifested in the same way through our social media. It's really about being available not just to your paying customers, but your potential consumers who are interested in our products and services. From another angle, in addressing our customers' trust and our brand and creating more value for them, I would like to share with you our professional ear piercing ser uh, service. Quick question to the audience. Might I have a show of hands of you who had your ears pierced? Years? Lot, I guess a lot of women, maybe? Wow. I guess not. A lot, I guess there's a lot of potential customers then. <laughs> but how about those who plan to have the years pierced? Maybe a bit more? So think about this. For those who had the years pierced, do you remember when and where that took place? Would you recommend the same service to those who sit next to you? We at Marbell thought about this very carefully. At first glance, you may wonder, what's the technological wonder or product innovation in this? Let's put it this way. The more we learn about, the more we know about technology and what it can do for us, the more we know what it can't do for us. In the case of ear piercing, you simply can't deliver the service online. Some may argue, that maybe you can deliver a DIY kit, uh, but do you really want to do that at home? So this is where my colleagues and I figured we can create a unique experience in the digital age. At any of our 90 stores in Hong Kong and China, we provide ear piercing service along with a two-year after-service plan. The entire process is ISO 9001 certified to ensure deli uh, we deliver a clean and safe service. All you need to do is to get all you need to do to get started is to go online or to one of the stores and uh, make a booking and we'll handle it from there. We integrated several online to offline O2O programs to uh, in launching the service, which includes having bloggers visit our stores to experience the service and write about them. The media that is created, such as blogs, photos, videos, is shared in a non-commercial manner. Readers read about the experience of getting their ears pierced from people they trust and learn about the, learn about the process and after-sales arrangements before they try it themselves. This is truly an O2O experience as our online channels will not be able to provide the ear piercing but can definitely share experiences in new ways new customers would like to learn. Since we started a year and a half ago, over 36,000 customers had their ears pierced at our shops. 
We have young professionals getting their second or even third year piercings, and even mothers bring their daughters for their first year piercings. I welcome those who are interested to visit our website or stores to learn more. So finding value to customers and building trust is like finding a diamond in the rough. It's about having the ability and desire to see ordinary things with new perspectives. When my father founded Marbell in 1993, he did so because he wondered why there wasn't a store that sells a $1,000 diamond ring in the Hong Kong market. This simple wonder gave us the opportunity to serve millions of customers throughout our throughout our 90 stores in Hong Kong and China over the past two decades. As for myself, my diamond in the rough moment occurred when I was 19, when I sold my first piece of jewelry, a piece of jewelry that I've never touched, paid by a customer that I've never met, shipped to a place I've never seen before, been before. All of this took place on eBay in the, in the United States. Back then, no one believed that it was possible. But then, I tried because I did not know better. Nor did I have the preconceptions of what can or cannot be done. Retrospectively, I understood what happened wasn't a matter of what we thought customers needed. More importantly, is what customers wanted. A piece of unique jewelry he can't find at his local stores shipped to him at a reasonable price so that he can give it to someone special. So at Marbell, we see ourselves not as not just a diamond company, but one that's always seeking, always seeks to understand the needs and wants of consumers. That is why Marbell is, it's diamond, it's different. Thank you very much. Thank you, Theodore. By the way, my, my daughter is 11 years old. She already got her ear piercing done. But the problem, though, is that uh, she told me she's going to bring a few of her classmates to do the same after the examination. I was so concerned. But maybe I can now call to you yes. to make it a safer, safer experience. Thank you. Our next guest is uh, Keith Lee. I get to know Keith um, for quite a few years now. Uh, he's uh, one of the founders uh, from the Cyberport community. It's, uh, he started a bit earlier than most. It was tough. It was a very difficult time. I always admire how, how he could have been uh, hanging there and hopefully tough it out. Uh, so I guess today, I mean, he's also an opinion leader in the entrepreneurship world. So uh, there's a lot, definitely a lot to share from him. So let's welcome Keith. Uh, thank you, Herman. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Okay, I, I, I think I, I want to step down so I can be more comfortable uh, when I'm closer to the audience. Um, so I'm Keith Lee, uh, so because we have only 10 minutes today, so I won't be doing a lot of introduction of myself. If you're interested, you can Google me or Google my company in the page. Okay, so the first slide I'm showing you is uh, an SCMP interview back in, I think, not, uh, 2005. And this was my first company. And as you can see, I was holding a mobile phone, and I was, uh, dem I was, I was trying to demo a location-based application on a mobile phone, which uh, my first company developed. So obviously, that didn't really work, because it was far too early. And um, today, if you uh, happen to run into a startup, telling you that they are uh, creating an LBS you know, or, or GPS-based uh, mobile application, you won't be surprised. But 10 years ago, 2005, I was doing just that, and everybody thought I was crazy, and I think I was. <laughs> okay, and um, so after a few years, uh, in uh, 2010, five years later, uh, when iPhones becomes popular, I started another startup, which is my current startup, InnoPage. Um, and we started developing a mobile uh, publishing system. That's why the company called InnoPage. So um, I did another interview with 
Next Magazine, and as you can see on the slide, uh, they wasn't very impressed. <laughs> so I, I think you have been, uh, if, you, if you were in the uh, opening speech this morning, you, you've heard a lot about failures, okay? So I've been through that. But I, I think failure is uh, uh, overrated. And of course, you, uh, failure is the best teacher, as Anthony said this morning. But I have to add one point to that. If you think it's no, no harm to, to, to be failed, if you start a startup, if I fail, it's no, no big deal. Uh, that attitude isn't going to get you very far. If, you, if you've done your best and you failed, that's okay. But you have to have the mindset to win. You have to have the determination to be successful, to be the winner, to take over the world. If you failed, it's no big deal. But if you have the mindset that, okay, I start a startup now and then I, I fail, but that's no big deal because everybody fails, uh, that is not going to work. And um, my experience is I have been uh, trying to do things that nobody has done before. I, I've, I've been doing the mobile apps in, in 2003, and I've been uh, trying to you know, uh, bring the uh, uh, mobile publishing system to the world when the iPad released. And some ideas, not so good, no? uh, not, not very, uh, working very well, but uh, you have to choose the right idea to, to work on. If you find it's... Um, the idea is not working, or the industry is not working, or the infrastructure is not ready, then you have to pivot. And that's exactly what we did. Um, okay. Um, we started the uh, mobile publishing system for around six months, and we think uh, the publishing industry is not a, you know, uh, it cannot be saved by technology. It's declining industry, and it's going to be keeping like that. You, you can't save the publishing world by you know, having an iPad. So we uh, pivot to become a outsourcing company. So we did a lot of other people's app. Um, and then we maintain a positive cash flow. But then we still have to remember that we are a startup that we want to create our own products that will change the world. So we spend 20% of, of our time. It's similar to the Google 20% time program. We have an internal program we call InnoLab uh, that we allow our staff to uh, use 20% of their working time, not doing anything uh, for the clients, but only doing on projects they think uh, uh, they are interesting to do or uh, they think uh, they, they believe in the idea, they think they can uh, make it big. So this is one of them, which is called Worthy. And Worthy is, a, uh, is one of the first apps to hit the U.S. App Store, uh, large, the largest banner on the, on the U.S. App Store. So we are not talking about Philippines App Store, not uh, uh, talking about you know, uh, Singapore App Store or, or the other local App Store. We are talking about U.S. App Store. So a local Hong Kong apps developer uh, having their app feature on the largest uh, banner, the most expensive place which you cannot buy on the App Store is something that is, uh, that was um, uh, quite impressive. Um, but if you have heard the news that this app was so popular that some, you know, largest company in China copied our, our idea. So um, we think this is maybe too easy to copy. So we, we did something else. Uh, we, we are now trying to develop something, something new. Uh, this is a stock portfolio manager. And uh, we, try to, we, we have a problem to solve. Uh, one of our partners uh, used to be an iBanker. So he has a very complicated way to calculate the, uh, his stock portfolio performance. And he tried to find an app to, uh, you know, to replace his Excel-based you know, uh, spreadsheet to calculate his uh, profit and loss on his stock portfolio, uh, stock portfolio. 
and he couldn't find one. The Bloomberg one didn't work, the Yahoo one didn't work, and many others didn't work. So he built it, uh, an app itself. And it happens that so many people are looking for the same thing. And the outcome is we are now spinning off this company with a new investor who has all the uh, real-time stock quo, uh, uh, financial news, and, and all the infrastructure. Um, and they are now having, uh, going to have a joint venture with us to spin off this new uh, uh, product as a separate company. So the, the message I want, to, I want to tell you is um, failure is, is, is okay, but you have to have the determination to become the, the winner, and you don't give up on that. If you think something didn't work, uh, you don't have to stick to it. You, you can pivot. You can think of something else to do, and this is exactly how, how we did it. Okay, and uh, this slide didn't work very well because I think that one of the phones didn't, didn't uh, go to the uh, other computer. But uh, this is a quote from Larry Page, uh, CEO of Google. He says, if you're not doing something crazy, you are doing the wrong thing. And I think as an entrepreneur, uh, all of you here should have this mindset. You don't have to listen to anybody who tells you you are crazy, or who tells you it's not possible, or tell you, don't do this, don't do that. You follow your heart. If you think this is the right thing to do, you just do it. If you fail, it's OK, but you have to give it all into it and try to become the winner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. I guess, I guess the accent is uh, fa failing is definitely OK. But you don't start a company so that you'll be able to fail, right? So you start a company so that, I guess, uh, you have a chance to be successful. And, uh, and uh, I guess the accent is to encourage you to be a little bit more risk-taking. So these two companies are, you know, Mabel, we have a lot of shops out there. You can touch them, you can see them. Uh, Keith's program, you can download it from the App Store, the Google, Google Play. So it's very, you know, very close to you. You can touch them and all that. Our next guest, however, he's working on something that's a little bit behind the scene. So, uh, so uh, it's, it's actually difficult to explain to people. So let's see how Dr. does it, does it today. Huh? Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Patrick Hong, and I'm co-founder of Velocity. Uh, we make uh, high-performance computing chips and solutions. This talk is entitled, What's Your Dream? Uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was in my PHP program, probably like most of you here, uh, not knowing what to do in life. Mm, perhaps you want to be the chief executive one day? Or perhaps you want to be uh, the university president one day. Or perhaps you want to marry someone rich. Well, anyway, for those of you who want to be an entrepreneur, uh, you want to build the next Tencent, the next Google, the next Apple. That should be your dream. Um, well, uh, these are some successful startups from Stanford. Uh, I was in the same research lab as uh, Larry Page, uh, founder of uh, Google, uh, Jerry Yang, founder of Yahoo. Um, probably they don't remember me anymore, but that, that's okay. <laughs> the key here is to build a team. We know that in a startup environment, a top talent is 10 times or more productive than a mediocre talent. So what you want to do is to attract the talents and uh, motivate them to work 80, 90 hours a week for two years. Okay, so we know that uh, Hong Kong U has the best talents in Hong Kong and in the world. So look around you, and you want to find someone who shares your vision and form a team. So where did we start? Um, 
we participated in a, a high-profile business plan competition uh, called Stanford Entrepreneur Challenge, maybe similar to uh, Dreamcatchers. And we were in the final uh, list. And we got um, immediate funding and um, some media attention attention, like we were in uh, local TV and also on uh, New York Times. But the important takeaway here is that funding and initial funding does not mean success. So we all know that what happened in the year 2000, 2001, we have the internet bubble and uh, the funding dried up and very, very painfully we have to lay off many hardworking, talented employees. So, what's the main takeaway here? So when you open a company, you need to prepare the, for the worst. And you need to be prepared that in the worst case, how you can face the hardworking employee and how you can look after them, even in the worst case scenario. So what did we do? Okay, we did not just give up, we adapt. I'm a true believer of what didn't kill you will make you stronger. That's very important. So we evolve and we are flexible and we keep changing. We partner with uh, some large Korean and Japanese company. We change from software model to hardware model. We are flexible. And uh, after two, three years, we were able to recover the uh, initial investment and return the investment back to the, the original backers. And after a few more years, we got funding from uh, some sources in China, and we were able to set up offices in China and also in Hong Kong. So, what's the main takeaway? So, if you can only remember one thing today. Remember to dream big. So if you want to start your company, dream big, think big. So that's number one. Number two, look around you and try to find good people, form a good team. You cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. And number three, be flexible, able to change. And most importantly, try to persist or do not do it. So if you follow these advices, I believe that there's a good chance that you will be successful. Good luck and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, our next guest uh, is Nick. I think Nick graduated from uh, Hong Kong U and then went to uh, Harvard for right, your right. master's degree. He is by no means an IT guy, he's, study, he's an architect. But then uh, I guess what you're doing now has uh, something to do with architect, but not a whole lot. Yeah. So let's see what he has to tell us. Okay, thank you, Herman. Um, so uh, really happy to be back and uh, haven't really thought about being here, not presenting something about architecture, but uh, it's good anyway. Uh, so yeah, I was from uh, Hong Kong U, graduated 2009 uh, from the architecture department. And then short after I went to Harvard to continue studying architecture, um, which was my dream and pretty much so still now, but in a different way, I guess. Um, so uh, it was really uh, a great experience for me to be in the States, one of the best school learning architecture. But at the same time, not only did I learn architecture, but I, you know, get exposed to many other things like, you know, entrepreneurship, uh, like other things that happened in the world that changed, kind of changed my mind or kind of make me think more about what I should do in the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, we, in, around Harvard, there's many other good schools, MIT and, you know, RISD and all that. And it happens that uh, I met some really uh, inspiring people who later uh, become part of my team, uh, the E1 team. 
I will explain a little bit more about uh, our name later. But uh, this is our initial team. Uh, uh, I'm from uh, GSD uh, Architecture to the right of me, actually. The, the Asian person is Hensu, our co-founder uh, and CEO now. And uh, David, a uh, uh, Hensu study uh, uh, business. David study uh, product design from RISD. And Amanda study um, graphic design from RISD as well. So we, we form a team and really uh, try to uh, have an idea that, uh, you know, to form a design company, basically, to try to design a product that serve a minority group and also serve uh, major people. Because uh, we think that um, design should be something that uh, being more universal. And, you know, the underprivileged group should also be uh, uh, benefited from whatever the uh, technology we have today. Uh, by maybe no means of uh, high, uh, high tech, but also just simple design. So uh, our company is called E1. It stands for Design for Everyone. Um, so quickly, uh, we, we set up our philosophy, as I said, that you know, we should think about design that can include more than you know, maybe a chair. Uh, or a chair is a piece of furniture, but maybe someone could not use that piece. And we think that what other group can use that piece that makes that design stronger. So we um, figured out a problem, uh, which is specifically to do with the uh, visually impaired community, or uh, we say the blind community. Um, so we look at all the products, and we found that watch is a very interesting piece. Because you know, like everyone sort of need a watch. Now we have other uh, tech watches, but uh, a simple timekeeping uh, product. Uh, the blind people don't really have one good design. Uh, to the left, it's a braille watch. You can touch the the hands of the watch, but it, when you touch it, it kind of goes away. So it doesn't make it as precise as normal watches. To the right is a talking watch. But when you use a talking watch, it kind of produces sound, which is intimidating, which is something uh, not many people or even the blind people would like to use. So we thought about, you know, why don't we uh, create some things uh, rather simple. Uh, we, we thought about using Braille. Why don't we use Braille? Braille is something intrinsic to the, uh, uh, you know, the daily life of blind or visually impaired people. So we, we quickly came up with uh, some prototypes that would you know, be simple enough to say, uh, to give to some of the users to, to test out. So we conducted pretty comprehensive uh, uh, research and talked to many of um, these uh, visually impaired or blind people to see how they think about the product. And of course, we, we go back and forth. And this is one of our early prototypes that features two balls uh, you know, uh, you know, that one tells the minute, one tells the hour. Uh, the top tells a minute, the side tells an hour, which is still our structure now. Uh, then we have more, um, more sort of prototyping and more design. So this is, uh, I think, really my education, architecture education gave me is that, you know, I was able to really quickly do this, uh, you know, uh, working together with David, of course, the product designer. But um, uh, then we had our, one of our earlier product, the final product, to then later we did a, a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so it's uh, a pretty well designed watch. There's two balls, uh, one on the top indicates the minute, on the side indicates the hour. So now you can see it's around, in the image it's around 1.46. Um, so besides that, we want to you know, maybe think a little bit more uh, what, what can we do next? Do we just have a really great product and bring to the world and try to sell it? And of course, we actually fell in pitching to many investors like, hey, you guys are just doing a, a very niche product. You don't have a really good market. Uh, investors don't like hardware pro, uh, companies, especially in the States. They want software company because they can grow bigger and faster. So we, we didn't have much choice, but we 
try to you know maybe do a crowdfunding later. So we thought about that, and then we go to find someone maybe beyond us, maybe bigger than us. So we are lucky enough to get Bradley Snyder on board. Brett is a uh, ex naval officer. It's um, really enthusi enthusiastic person and really passionate about basically life. So which his his life really inspired us. He was an ex naval officer. He went to Afghanistan and. He lost his sight, uh, very unfortunate. And after that, uh, he competed in the Paralympics and he got gold medals, which is a very inspiring figure in the States. Uh, also to us, I guess, to everyone. So uh, we, we, we had him on board and thought that he would be a really good figure and he's really bigger than us. And we really want to embrace him instead of maybe our design or our team. So. Uh, and uh, this is uh, his image getting the gold medal. And we had him, you know, really uh, together with us work with a video, you know, talking about his sort of life, his passion, and how, you know, he influenced the E1 team. So uh, with no ways, no investment from uh, normal investors, we went on to do a, a, a crowdfunding uh, campaign uh, on the Kickstarter in 2013 uh, summer. So uh, we did pretty well, which is pretty overwhelming at the beginning. And, uh, um, but I mean, we had other problems. Uh, I guess today I won't be able to cover that much, but this is a pretty uh, a convincing start to really for us to spin off to a, a company. And, uh, and then we, we did fulfill at the end, and now it becomes, uh, you know, like more comprehensive and uh, better company. And then we keep going to have our own other products, and we hope that we can develop better products in the future as well. Um, so uh, this is really our first simple dream. Maybe it really doesn't um, uh, do much to normal people, but this is our little dream, and that we made it come true, and hope that. Um, people uh, in this room or, you know, uh, others who know about the company can really uh, learn about us and be inspired to do other things. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. So a company really use Kickstarter to get your first batch of order and do it to a, to a real company. So that's really interesting. So we have a few of the entrepreneurs with us today. Some of them take the family business to a global business online. We have Keith to turn ideas into projects. And then we have uh, uh, Patrick share with us you know, his uh, journey of taking and pivoting a few times and, and share with us a lot of tips and also Nick. So I want to open the floor to, uh, to the floor for any questions that you may have. Oh, while you're thinking, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll find a few questions myself first. Uh, first, I'm actually interested, uh, uh, Keith. So you actually started this thing in uh, 2005, and then uh, you do another project in 2010, and then last year, I know you're worthy, you have all that. I know that the um, startup environment in Hong Kong has changed uh, tremendously throughout the last 10 years. So you were the one who actually is in the middle of all that. Can you share with us what, what's the differences? I know many of us are now saying the environment now is much better, improved it and enhanced it and all that. But if you would take another angle, what has gone worse? Right, uh, so, so for the last 10 years, there has been you know, tremendous change in the, in the startup uh, environment. Um, so 10 years ago, um, because the internet bubble just, you know, just burst and uh, everybody um, is avoiding anything IT. So investors avoiding anything IT and uh, uh, the Chinese market is, is not as mature as, as today. So I think um, today is, is it's better in the sense that we are starting having an ecosystem in Hong Kong. And uh, in, those day, in those days, we, we didn't have um, a good community. We don't have uh, talks like this. We, we have business talks on, on uh, uh, internet startups, but we don't have the 
uh, we don't have the community that to, to share experience with others. So I, I think in today's world, it's um, easier to, to, to do startups because if you need help, you can reach out to your fellow entrepreneurs and uh, you can reach out to Cyberport, you know. <laughs> so um, in, in those days, we, we didn't have that. But what has gone worse? What, what is not as good as before? Okay, what's got worse is, I, I think too many people trying to start a company because they want to start a company. And that's why we have a little bit of a uh, problem in the uh, 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 you know, talent management and recruitment. So I have a few, because I, I've been telling everybody to, to do startups. So uh, many of our staff had uh, left our company to start their own startups. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's uh, good and bad. I, I, I like to see our staff to uh, uh, do their own startup and become successful. But um, uh, there, there are more, more chances that these people are... Um, trying to start a startup because they don't want to take orders or they want a more flexible life. And uh, I can assure you that uh, that will not be the case because when you do startups, you are working you know, 24 by 7 uh, all year round. So if you want a better life, uh, don't start a startup. Okay. Well, I, how many of you in the audience today are... Th are starting a business or thinking about doing a startup yourself? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, so a few of those. I, I actually experienced the same thing. Uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, teams trying to uh, start projects and all that. One advice I think which Keith uh, actually rightly pointed out. Many of, many of the teams do not really know what they are signing up for. They don't know what it, what it, what it means by starting up your own company. I guess one way is to, of course, like today, we come here to listen to experts and learn from the experience, but, but those are secondhand. Uh, the other way is to maybe do a summer internship, maybe do a, a one-year internship as a part-time, whatever, to work with some of the founders. You, by doing that, can really gain some insightful experiences, and then you can, you know, think about whether this is the best choice for you. But then, of course, you know, when you are still young and you just get out of the college, you have uh, um, a little bit more chips on your hands to, you can play with. So by all means, you are invited to experience it, but do it smartly. That's my, my advice, I guess. Uh, any, any questions from the floor? If no, I'll continue to keep going. I have prepared a lot of questions. Okay. The second one, uh, perhaps I will... Uh, let's, let's continue with uh, that theme a little bit. Uh, Patrick. You didn't mention enough in your presentation, I think, that you actually started your project when you were in Stanford. Uh, it was the time right before the dot-com bubble burst. Actually, interesting enough, a few days ago, I listened to another talk from, uh, from uh, Peter Thiel from uh, PayPal. His company also was very close to, uh, he, he's PayPal, right? Everybody is using, using PayPal today. He was also very close to um, uh, have to shut down his company. He got his funding right before, a month before the dot-com burst actually came, and therefore he has enough money and resources to, uh, to go through the, the difficult situation. Now, if you, if you think back then and now, you were now in Hong Kong, the Stanford and Hong Kong, what, what sort of uh, uh, reflection do you have and, and you can share with the audience today? Um, if I can do things differently, I probably will move back to China earlier. So that's number one. But having said that, uh, you all know that there are differences between Silicon Valley and Asia. Number one is the valuation. The valuation in America is much, much higher than the company valuation in China and in Hong Kong. So you need to uh, be aware of that. And the second thing is the culture, the people culture. So if you set up a company in China, uh, the employees are very hardworking, very, very obedient, but they might not be uh, too loyal to you uh, sometimes and uh, not uh, necessarily creative. On the other extremes, uh, in the U.S., 
the background is more diverse. Not that they are smarter, but you have people from all over the world. Um, as a result, uh, the products, ideas, and the marketing plans tend to be more creative. So in Hong Kong, we have very smart people, very hardworking, uh, but I wish it could be less homogeneous when you start a company. So if you can, try to get uh, people from different backgrounds. So that would be my uh, uh, two cents. So actually, that leads into my, my next question quite well. Uh, Nick, you show the picture of your founding team members, mm -hmm. and they obviously has a very diverse background. Right. And now, I guess because of, because of that, now you have operation not only in Hong Kong, but in other areas uh, uh, as well. Right. So, so, so how would you recommend building a diverse team, and how does that help you? Um, well, I think... Uh, as many other speakers have mentioned, the, the partners in your company or founding partners, uh, they're really important and they really uh, sort of set the tone or define what the, the potential of your company could be. Um, I think, um, you know, like most likely uh, your founders, co-founders are people you already have met in your life, maybe your classmates, your friends, uh, some relatives or, you know, other people uh, that sort of are connected. Um, that would really, uh, you know, help you to, to sort of come, uh, bind the, the team together. But uh, on the other hand, you, it has to be diverse enough. I, I mean, looking at our own company, the way we run is, uh, uh, it's, it's small, but it's international. You know, we have people in, in US, Hong Kong, and, and South Korea. But then uh, I guess it's because the team is small and, and young enough, we keep communication really close. And because of that, we're able to you know, manage things really ac across the globe. And for Hong Kong, of course, I think it's a really good place to me as a product person maybe, because going back to China, it's uh, such an easy thing to do. And you know, so, uh, the, the Guangdong province, we have like three, four, 100 kilometers of factories. But of course, we have to be careful about that. But uh, what I want to say is that Hong Kong, it's stable enough for us to be safe and settle here to do things and connect to other places in the world. Yeah, questions on the floor? Thank you, Herman. Uh, a question to Dr. Hong, if I may. Uh, Stanford has literature or has spun off a number of test startups. Uh, is, there, is there anything that Hong Kong U or university here in Hong Kong could learn? Um, I think uh, uh, every university has its forte, and I believe Hong Kong U has done very well. Um, there are the two main things uh, that are very important for startup. One is funding, another is marketing. So I think uh, Hong Kong U or uh, Hong Kong government can work with the VC to help fund the company, which is very important. That's number one. Number two is the marketing. The market in Hong Kong is uh, decent, but it's small compared with China. And the problem is, in China, there are lots of uh, relationship, guanxi, that's what they call it, and uh, I, I wish uh, and I hope that the Hong Kong government and the academia in Hong Kong can help startup company to do that because startup does not have resources to do all these relationship things. All right, another question? Um, this is the question for uh, Keith. Um, you have said that uh, you have uh, established a company in 2005 and then another company in 2010. Uh, I would like to know, do you have any um, sharing? Uh, say, for example, if you start something and it turns out it doesn't work. So what's, what, what can you do? Or, or maybe your idea is easily copied by someone. But you have your expenditure. You have to continue. So, but you cannot think of another idea immediately. So, do we have any sharing in this kind of situation? Thank right. you. Right. Okay. So, the question is if you uh, find your idea doesn't work and you don't have a backup idea, 
You don't have a plan B, what do you do? Um, okay, so, so this is what happened to me uh, in my first uh, venture. Uh, I, I was uh, making mobile apps for these tiny Nokia phones. And I, I knew that it didn't work because I've waited for years and years and the, uh, the smartphone isn't, still isn't very user friendly. And uh, you know, data plan is still expensive. Um, I, I, I can tell you that I, I, I played it too late. You know, I, I have to, I have to give up on the uh, idea that didn't work. But I, I, I didn't. I stay on, and then I have to wait for the iPhone until I can start another company. So the answer, the short answer is, uh, if you think that doesn't work, you have to, you know, cut the loss. You have to think of another idea. So, so there's no other way. So for this time around, uh, I'm, I'm starting my new company. I always have two or three plans. So when I'm doing this part, I'm, when I was doing um, mobile publishing for the, you know, in 2010, I was already spending 20% time researching on other business. So I'm always thinking five years ahead. And I, I, I just, I'm, I'm not just thinking, I'm already spending time, spending investment on the uh, you know uh, more you know uh, uh, advanced uh, research, and when I find out the um, the original you know, publishing idea didn't work, um, I have to switch to a consulting based business. So so I, we made a lot of other people's apps, but that turns out to be uh, to be a pretty good business. So just like Cherry Picks, they, they, they were, you know, they, are, they, are, they have sold for, you know, the millions and millions of dollars. So, um, but, but then I, I have a pressure on that because everybody tell, uh, were telling me that I'm not a real startup because I'm just a consulting business. I'm just a production house. But while I, I was working on the cash flow, I spent my time researching on other projects. So if you, if you have just one idea, I, I suggest you... Uh, think of something else and work in parallel. So doing, your, doing consulting work cannot be a startup? That's pretty new to me. I've never heard that. Anyway, uh, there's one more question from there. I've got a question for Theodore. From your experience uh, in running Mabel and also your other ventures like Cocoon, can you share with us some of your experience on the differences and similarities of uh, expanding or transforming a family business versus starting a new entrepreneur? Thank you very much for the question. A very good one. Um, comparing essentially what I do at Cocoon and also um, at Mabel, I think uh, some of the similarities has a lot to do with identifying the vision because uh, it's having a very clear vision for startups keeps the team going, even when you're not making money, even when everyone tells you it doesn't work. It's actually the same for uh, larger corporations because larger corporations have a very strong culture and a very dominant like how things were. So for, for example, when I had to push online retailing in my own um, own company, it's very important that I articulate the vision very clearly and identify uh, first year, second year, third year, even the fifth year goals that we have, about that we need to meet in order to so-called prove that the idea works. And I believe uh, the, even the panelists on, on the stage would agree. It's, it's same for the startups. Uh, it's very important that you have a game plan. But then again, you can have multiple game plans. That's also something very important because your team depends on you. The team depends on the founder, giving them the vision and the security that things are going to be better every day, even though we're going through hell right now. So that's, uh, that's how I think some, some of the similarities uh, I find in uh, building my online business within a much, uh, I, mean, a dom I mean, a jewelry business, and at the same time working with the various startups at Cocoon. Okay, I have the mic, so I'll ask the last question. Nick, starting from you. So everybody will have, a, just give me a very quick one, very quick one, the top, top advice you have for the audience today from dream to reality. What is your 
Number one advice. Uh, persistence. Passion. Pretty much the same. Determination. <laughs> wow, everyone just had one word. If, if you don't mind, I have a few more. <laughs> Actually, I think it's, a very, it's very important to, de uh, to go for big ideas and not mediocre ideas. I've met a lot of people who, who wants to do a startup around a mediocre idea and expect a huge financial reward. Don't do that. It, it just doesn't work. If you don't dream big enough, don't expect the financial reward to be big. So I think uh, my, my, my thing is dream big, therefore you have a much bigger financial reward. Dream small, have a small financial reward. That's fine. I mean, businesses are businesses. Don't, I mean, that's, that's something I, I find uh, important. So, so, so for me, actually, I, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, uh, the opportunity to listen to uh, Jack Ma's speech, Ma Wan. So one thing I, I, th I think I really like is that he said, uh, in Chinese terms, uh, So you have a thousand you know, dreams, methods, you know, ideas you want to do before you go to sleep at night. The next morning when you wake up, you go back to the same way of doing things. So execution is really important. When you have a great idea, go and try and execute it. How do you do so though? My advice to you is uh, advertising time, cyber port. Uh, we have a lot of program. So if you go, for example, if you join our program, if you find them fit, uh, you can have access to $730,000 Hong Kong free of charge. So no equity, no repayment and you have the opportunity to meet with the diverse team, learn a lot about different things. So go execute, go try it, go do it. Don't just sit still. Things are not going to happen. It will not change until you make the first move. So with that, let's go get ready for Pony Mask speech. Thank you.